Thank you, Karen. Uh, and welcome, everyone. My name is Charles Lee. I'm the current president of the Human oh, Genome oh, Organization, uh, or, or what's known as HUGO. Um, as some of you may know, HUGO has been a long-standing organization in bringing together scientists from around the globe. Uh, it was uh, founded in 1988, uh, near the beginning of the Human Genome Project. And we're actually very excited this year uh, marks an, uh, another important year for Hugo in that uh, we are bringing together two other organizations, uh, uh, the Human Variome Project or HVP and the Human Genome Variation Society, HGVS, uh, into one organization. Uh, and uh, the, this merged organization actually will have its first uh, uh, meeting of the executive board later this month. So we're really, uh, I think, this is, a, um, this is a reminder for all of us that in fact, even though we're uh, uh, at the tail end of a pandemic, uh, nothing stops science. Uh, science continues to go on. And I'm absolutely delighted by the fact that uh, we have this teaser of a meeting um, with three fantastic speakers. Uh, this uh, teaser meeting has been organized by Karen Abraham, uh, who's at the Tel Aviv University and a Hugo board member. Uh, and Iran Meshor, uh, who is at the Hebrew uh, University of Jerusalem, uh, to just give you a, a flavor of the quality of science that continues to go on in human genetics and also to uh, reflect uh, the science that will be happening uh, and presented at our, um, at our human genome variation meeting uh, at, on October the 4th to 6th. Uh, in, the plan is to have that in Tel Aviv. Uh, and, uh, on site, and I hope that each one of you will continue to get your vaccinations, uh, practice social distancing, stay safe, uh, so that we can see each other in person. So, uh, with that, let me hand it over to our organizer, uh, Karen Abraham, please. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Charles, and for that introduction. And it's it's really wonderful to be together, even if we are in these boxes. As somebody in a seminar I was not I was at not too long ago said, "Zoom airlines." So I thought that that was cute, but I hope that we'll be using different airlines in October when you all join us. So I have the pleasure to introduce our first speaker and I'm so excited to introduce Professor Shawa Shen. And unfortunately, when I was in Beijing last time, I missed seeing Professor Shen, but we have started collaborating together and her work is remarkable. And I thought it would be a wonderful opportunity we all did to have her share her work with you. So Professor Shen is uh, at the School of Medicine at Shanghua University in, in, uh, in Beijing. She is a professor there and um, she did her first degree, uh, she did her PhD at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And then she went on to do her postdoc with someone we know well, Stu Orkin at the Harvard Medical School. And then she became a professor at the School of Medicine and where she has been since. She has received numerous awards for her work and she's published incredibly well. I think that many of you are familiar with the research that she's done. And what she's really tried to focus on is to understand how non-coding portions of the genome influence chromatin structure, gene expression, and stem cell fate and development. And she's looked at novel aspects of non-coding RNAs and really has brought about a paradigm shift in our understanding of genomic and their associated transcripts and how they organize the genome and higher order chromatin structure. So thank you very much, Professor Shen, for joining us today. I know it's late for you, so we appreciate your staying up and giving us a talk at this time, and we look forward to hearing more. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, my voice is all right? Perfect, yes. I'm gonna um, share my screen. Um, okay, the screen is all right? Yes. Uh, well, actually, we're now in, in the other presentation mode. You need to do a swap, what you did earlier. I think if you're on two screens, then we're seeing the presentation, not the presentation mode. Um, 
um, okay, hold on, let me try again. Okay, is it good? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, the kind, your kind introduction and the and um, and the opportunity here uh, to share my our experience in glancing at the lung coding genome. And I'm so also so excited to see um, familiar names faces and also to meet new friends here. Um, so um, this um, this is my favorite slide and also the light that led me into the wonderland of lung coding genome. So this table is adapted from Geomatic Bioassay 2007. Um, when, I, uh, when I still doing postdoc in Stu Walking's lab, I was shocked at that time to look at our genome is 30 fold larger than worm, which is only have uh, 1000 cells, uh, but yet we have the same number of genes. So obviously, much of the uh, developmental and the phenotypic complexity um, arise from gene regulation rather than increasing number of protein coding genes. So in the past, we have um, known much, so much in particular pathways, we know transcription, epigenetic regulation, gene regulatory networks. Um, however, big pictures, um, fundamental questions like raised by Science Magazine in early this century, um, we still, these pictures remains lacking. What a genetic change made us unique human? How does a single somatic cell become a whole plant or animal? Um, the question I'm interested, in, long standing question I'm interested in, the cell fate, how distinct, uh, distinct epigenetic fate established the level during development from a totipotent cell um, to an uh, uh, embryo and to an uh, animal. Um, as trained as a um, uh, stem cell biologist and um, also who in, in, interested in epigenetics, I feel like to study, study epigenetic modifier alone um, cannot answer the question, this question. Um, so it, my voice is okay, is it big enough? You hear me well? Yes, we hear you fine. Good. So, um, so when I stepped to my lab in Tsinghua University, um, I decided to back up a step to look at our genome. Um, so we all familiar that um, uh, more than 80, 50% uh, of genome are genomic repeats. 80% uh, of them are transcribed to produce thousands of non-coding RNA transcripts. And uh, how this lung coding portions, including repeat, repetitive sequence and the lung coding RNA, influence gene expression and influence our cell fate. That's the question we explore in lab. When we think about cell fate, we often talk about a specific gene expression, specific gene expression programs. Less often we think about the uh, cells, different type of cells, stem cells, fully differentiated cells, they have a robust conserved core to protect the integrity of our nuclear organization and the transcription. So my talk today, I'm gonna to focus on genomic repeat, how they regulate the macroscopic uh, gene uh, chromatin structure to form a conserved robust core. On this core, dynamic gene regulation that contributed in part by lung coding RNA that lead to the exp uh, expression fine tuning, heterogeneity, and perhaps biodiversity and the complexity. So my talk today is gonna focus on the first part um, that are very briefly to summarize lung coding part at the end of my talk. Uh, almost a hundred years ago, uh, German scientist Emil Hirsch proposed the term uh, euchromatin and the heterochromatin. We know our genome is, um, is divided into two spatially segregated compartments. Um, 
as hydrochromatin and euchromatin. And this compartment social with distinct transcription activity and density, CPGN and histone, histone marks, and also replication timing. For example, here you can see early replication genes that are marked by red color position in the interior of the nucleus, while late replication timing genes marked by green color here are um, placed at this, um, uh, uh, underneath of the nuclear membrane and also outside of the nucleolus. And this pattern of chromatin organization as hydrochromatin and euchromatin is conserved for uh, 500 million years in evolution from cellulase to human. So this hydrochromatin and euchromatin also term as a, uh, as a AB compartment that uh, this AB compartment is actually defined a term uh, that proposed by Lieberman, Aiden, and Decker 2008. Um, even though the hydrochromatin and the uh, euchromatin has been known for almost a century, but the basic principles uh, govern this chromatin compartmentalization um, still largely unknown. Because um, most of our focus is on the, in the field is on chromatin regulators such as CTCF and cohesion. Unfortunately, disruptive proteins um, have very subtle uh, influence on the chromatin or, or compartmentalization, but they do influence uh, loop interactions. They influence promoter and enhancer interactions. So the, this uh, chromatin compartmentalization uh, euchromatin hydrochromatin um, or AB compartment. Uh, I want to say they are also they are also invariant. They are conserved and stable in different cell types across animals and human species. And also they are stable during sulfate transition. Well, uh, sub TADs or loop, uh, loop domains, they are more variable um, to facilitate different gene expression. So then what controls this a, uh, compartmental conservation? Um, the conserved com compartments suggest one thing, there must be one principle that all cells stick to while coping with shifting signals in different state. When we look at pro, um, the protein coding, um, Enfison uh, discovered that amino acid sequence of a protein determines its structure and function. So what about genome folding? Maybe the structural information that embedded in the, our genome itself, and their evidence have suggest homologous sequence pairing and the polymer simulation or suggest um, um, this, there's a sequence information, genetic, genetic coding information um, in our genome that, con that control the, uh, our genome organization. But then what DNA sequence, um, experimental evidence to support the role of DNA sequence. So let's like look at a uh, repetitive sequence. Um, a repetitive sequence constituted about uh, 50 to 70 percent of the human genome, and um, uh, the um, they are, they are DNA repeat and also uh, transposon derived repeat, uh, retrotransposon derived repeat. I want to draw your attention to two uh, repeat subfamilies. One is Li1, also called A1, and the other one is called Alu or B1. Um, it's uh, Alu in human and B1 in in mouse. So L1, B1, they are long and short in dispersed nuclear elements. And these two repeat subfamilies comprise more than 20 to 30% of our genome, while protein coding gene only accounts, the protein coding axons only accounts um, 2%, uh, if we consider introns to probably 20, 25%. So it's quite remarkable, these two kind of repeat that comprise um, a large portion of our genome. 
yet their study is uh, largely um, um, out there understudied. They have been thinking as the selfish DNA genomic parasite, but, but recent uh, work have suggest they play active roles in um, wiring our genome uh, gene regulatory network. A work we published uh, um, last year um, uh, show that um, gen uh, genomic repeat, they are not, they are not randomly uh, distributed in the genome. Actually, they have patterns. For example, um, here you look at the three kind of repetitive sequ sequence, sign repeat, which B1 alone belong to, they are more likely associated with uh, housekeeping genes with active high level expression. For example, those genes involve the RNA process in ribosome biogenesis and the translation. Well, genes associated with a specialized function such as uh, uh, cytochrome P450 or factor neuron receptor genes and uh, immunoglobin genes only express in terminal differentiated cells and these genes, they are often uh, silenced in most majority of cell types that are associated with L1 repeat in their promoter region, intron, and uh, upstream, downstream regions. And, and, and we are all familiar that developmental genes, they are, um, they are associated with low complexity sequence, such as CPG, INM. Okay. And this repeat, repetitive sequence, uh, we believe they provide um, bonding site, transmitting factor bonding site, also compatibilize these genes in different nuclear domains to correlate, to correlate their expression um, during the development, different developmental stages. So, um, so um, we, we uh, a bioinformatics student, Yu Yang in our lab, no, he has left a lab to do post in the United States. And he wants to see whether this repetitive sequence have for um, how they distribute it relative to A B compartment in the genome. So what you look at here is the um, um, this heat map. Each row shows um, shows a, a two adjacent compartments. So the whole uh, this is uh, based on um, mouse and brain stem cell high C data uh, from Bean Rain's lab. And uh, um, so you see two, this heat map shows the two adjacent compartments. And you can see here, uh, B1 repeat and L1 repeat, they seem to distribute resigning exclusive to different compartments. If you see high levels of B1, then you see depletion of L1 and, and vice versa. And this pattern we only observed for this uh, two repeat, B1 and L1, but not for other repeat such as uh, uh, a close uh, a subtype of line repeat L2 and the YAV or random sequences. And the B1 repeat, um, the compartment in which they in B1 repeat, they are correlated with active chromatin states, such as hyper -DNA, uh, DNA's one hypersensitive site, port 2 bounding K4 trimethylation mark and the high level RNA, um, RNA signals. And the L1 repeat, correlated with repressive marks, such as H uh, hydrochromotin protein 1 alpha, which is a hydrochromotin mark, and a K9 trimethylation mark. And I'll come back to this mark at it, um, um, uh, later on. So B1 <coughs> resides in A compartment, and A1 resides in B compartment. And then uh, we lay the, um, so this is a high C heat map, um, and uh, we superimpose the repeat feature with this high C, um, high C map, and this is a representative here. You can see here three B1, um, there are three B1 rich segments um, labeled here, D, F, H, and that correlate with compartment A, and, the, and therefore L1 reached um, segment correlated with the B compartment, which is hydrochromatin domains. And then we look at their interaction in this heat map. As you can see, uh, these two B compartments interact with each other. You see red color here, which indicate high interaction frequency. Well, this B1 compartment uh, here, uh, even though very close to um, 
two adjacent L1 rich segment, but in the liquid space, there's uh, no interaction or less interaction. So you can see here you see strong homotypic interaction in between L1, L1, and B1, D1 repeats. Well, um, well, uh, hydrotypic contacts are depleted. There's another way look at um, there is another way to look at this interaction, and uh, maybe I should uh, um, have the. So uh, this is a um, um, L1 rich sequence and interact with all other L1 rich sequence indicated by the yellow arrow here. And uh, here there's a um, B1 rich sequences and interact with all other B1 sequences. Well, well, there's L1 rich sequences. You see a depleted, you see a uh, no interaction, which is blue color here. So it seems like the distribution and the interaction status of L1, B1 closely match to the high C plate pattern. So based on this, we, we wondered whether just based on the L1, B1 distribution um, across the genome, um, we can reconstruct our um, compartments. Uh, so we did the de novo compartment coding just based on the density of L1, B1 DNA. Very simple, either uh, log two larger than um, zero or smaller than zero. And uh, we can construct 80% of A and B compartments. So um, it, it's, it's very nice to see this high correlation. Next, we want to see in the nucleus space how this sequence is distributed in the nucleus. So this is a DNA fish performed by Yu Jie Sun's lab by Chang Lei at the Peking University. So this is a close uh, uh, collaboration with the Sun lab. And as you can see here, L1 DNA sequences distribute um, um, underneath the nuclear membrane and also um, in the um, outside of uh, nucleolus, I'll, show, I'll just show you in a moment. And this is a nucleolus. And, and the B1 is in, inside the uh, nuclear interior. And there's no overlap between L1 and the B1. So, um, so just by image, you can see L1 and the B1 reside in distinct uh, complementary nuclear domains. And then we wonder whether this is conserved across different cell types. Indeed, we look at five different cell types, um, prepotent stem cell, multipotent neural stem cell, fibroblast, um, and so on, also in human cells. And you also see this pattern, L1 located um, um, at the peripheries of the nucleus and the nucleolus, and uh, while B1 in the interior of the nucleus that uh, correlate with AB compartment. And this pattern is also dynamically established during cell cycle progression and also in early uh, embryonic development. And this pattern is conserved, that also conserved in, in, with the high C, usually high C compartment and the tests are conserved during immune differentiation and across different cell types. So next, we, you will say, oh, this is very nice. And L1, B1 may be just a, a marker for u chromatin and hetero compartment. Um, is that a cause for, is that an um, instructive signal or cause for the compartment organization um, to, I, I don't think we can directly answer this question right now, um, but we know transcription and the nuclear architecture are closely interdependent on each other, inter, uh, closely uh, interdependent and influence each other. So, so we ask, because this, uh, this repetitive sequence, they transcribe repetitive RNA, long coding RNA. So we ask a function of RNA produced from this sequence, how they play a role in genome organization. Here we particularly look at L1 sequence because L1 that's comprised 70% of mouse and human genome. It's, it's the largest subtype of uh, retrotransposome repeat. And uh, um, early work from Mernie's lab showed that uh, hydrochromate interactions may play a more important role in nuclear organization than euchromatin contacts. So we look at L1, and we used L1 uh, antisense morphonino to inhibit L1 RNA transcript 
and then we perform the DNA fish. As you can see, uh, in wild type, uh, the scramble RNA you see still see the, this uh, uh, very clear segregation of L1, B1 sequences in the nucleus. While uh, look uh, depletion L1 RNA 12 and 36 hour, and you see these two colors start to kind of mingle together that indicate decreased segregation of these two um, compartments. Well, this is independent of L1 uh, retrotransposer activity. It's, uh, AZ, AZT treatment uh, show no effect. Uh, to further confirm this um, defect, we also perform the high C. And um, uh, indeed, um, um, L1 scramble, L1 um, uh, uh, compared to the scramble control, L1 AMO caused a decreased um, segregation between these two repetitive sequences. Um, you can clearly see here. And the compartment strength also decreased uh, significantly uh, upon uh, inhibition of L1 sequence. Um, we also have uh, um, many other evidence. We show that because of time, I, I don't show you the data. Uh, we perform oligopaint DNA fish, and we, we look at individual chromosome segments, their interactions. We found that um, inhibit L1 RNA, um, RNA indeed um, decreased homotypic clustering and uh, increased um, uh, and increased heterotyp uh, heterotypic class, abnormal heterotypic uh, interaction between L1 and B1. And we also see inhibition L1 RNA need to um, movement um, L1, um, L1 sequence outside of the uh, nuclear periphery and the nucleolar periphery. So for more detail, you can see um, you're welcome to read our paper. It's just recently published. And uh, next, we try to probe the mechanism. Um, we found L1 RNA uh, mostly target its own DNA sequence, as you can see here, and uh, uh, see very well uh, correlation. And uh, this DNA sequence uh, show enriched HP1 um, and uh, Funding and the K9 trimethylation marks. Uh, well, a B1 sequence um, that um, show uh, um, deplete of B1 sequences. We found that uh, L1 RNA, L1 RNA promote HP1 alpha, alpha phase separation in vitro. Um, so uh, I, I want to um, I want to note that uh, HP1 alpha. Um, cannot phase separate on its own, but phase separate with RNA, L1 RNA and DNA. However, it does not have much sequence specificity, at least in vitro situation. So we think because the uh, um, abundance and the co-localization of L1 RNA DNA and HP1 alpha in heterochromal domain, we think this might be a location derived specificity for this interaction. Um, RNA, L1 RNA DNA phase separation with H1 alpha, HP1 alpha may drive phase separation of hydrochromatin formation. So to summarize this part of our uh, work, and uh, um, I show you homotypic clustering of uh, L1, B1 forms gro grossly exclusive nuclear domains, characterize and predicts high C compartment. So um, we propose L1 and B1 DNA sequences serve as the genetic base for AB compartment. And the um, L1 sequence most enriched in the nuclear, per, uh, nuclear periphery on the least the nuclear membrane and outside of nucleolus, uh, show as the red uh, lines here. And the B1 um, enriched sequences most distributed in the nuclear in the nuclear interior as this um, um, uh, green color here. And we think this L1, B1 uh, DNA sequences, um, they are abound because their abundancy and the stack scattering features, they may provide numerous nucleation point or structure code to seed formation of nuclear domains. 
and the homotypic clustering in these L1 rich regions, B1 rich regions initiate genome folding. And I also provide you the evidence depletion of L1 RNA uh, drastically alter high C compartment and the nuclear localization and the segregation of repeat DNA. So because the essentiality of L1 RNA in compartmentalization, so we think it may have L1 repeat may have a uh, causative role in driving the um, um, or transacting the genetic, the structural information embedded in the DNA sequence into spatially ordered chromatin uh, via phase separation. This RNA may include uh, um, proteins such as HP1 alpha and maybe many, RNA, many, uh, many other RNA bonding proteins to increase the local molecular crowding to drive the phase separation of this uh, distinct domains and, uh, and also to drive their segregation of these distinct domains. And uh, these structures may be stabilized by attaching uh, this repetitive sequence to sublucleus structures as a nuclear membrane, a peripheral of nucleolus or nucleus speckle. Um, lastly, I want to cautious that um, this, I want to note that this uh, L1, B1 compartments may represent a um, structure functional ground state. And this ground state uh, dynamic gene regulation is overlaid. Um, um, compared to transcription factors, uh, epigenetic regulator and histone marks, because uh, all these mechanisms have to act upon DNA sequence. So we think the, repeat, the signal, repeated sig DNA provide is rudimental um, to other epigenetic regulations. And also there are many uh, next questions to be answered. Um, uh, how to, um, um, from qualitative evidence to causative effect, uh, how homotic clustering occur, what, uh, exactly function of um, um, repeat RNA transcription and what protein mediate this process. These are questions to be answered in, in future studies. Um, so we think um, this uh, um, L1B1 um, provide uh, DNA sequence. Um, um, they serve, they, they, um, they instruct macroscopic genome folding and provide a common conserved core on this core structure, dynamic gene regulation uh, is overlaid across different cell types. I think I'm gonna very quickly use one slice to summarize. Um, oh, okay, there's some problem. <laughs> um, hopefully my, my PPT stopped working. Um, I'm um, sorry, sorry, I'm gonna um, restart this program. I don't know what happened to my computer, it really don't, doesn't happen this. Um, Um, I think because time, um, so um, I'm, uh, I, I, I think I'm going to just summarize uh, work we have done on non-coding RNA. And then we, uh, we had many others have shown that uh, RNA acting, um, acting on chromatin to modulate transcription and, uh, and the chromatin state. Um, so there's two examples shown here. Uh, this link A, um, moderate uh, divergent link A, moderate nearby protein coding genes and participate in similar developmental and biological processes as its uh, uh, coding gene labors. Um, and, um, and also link A, they, their DNA sequences and the RNA transcripts can play opposing roles uh, to influence their common packaging expression and participate in um, uh, fine-tuning gene protein coding gene expression. And uh, we also provide evidence that uh, 
uh, as many Ninkai acting on chromatin, so there must be some mechanism to control their local, uh, their, their chromatin retention. And we show that uh, U1 uh, splicing, splicing machinery uh, played a role in this process. So um, to summarize, um, so this is um, um, my acclodium slice. Uh, the repeat work um, done by two, three talented students, Yu Yang, Tong, and Lei. And this is a close collaboration with uh, Yu Jie Sun at Peking University. Um, and, uh, and that's all. Thank you for your attention. Professor Shen, thank you so much. That was exceptional. We actually have one question written in the chat and then we'll ask if anybody else has questions. So the question is, uh, are there any epigenetic effects that would affect your model? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so, um, we, um, so, um, so the all genome folding, we think this repetitive DNA is the, the first because uh, epigenetic has to, to be acting upon uh, DNA sequence, transcription acting upon uh, DNA sequences. Um, but, um, but DNA alone, DNA information embedded, structural information embedded in DNA sequence has to be transacted by its uh, by other mechanisms, for example, uh, repeat RNA and other, uh, and then reinforced by epigenetic mechanisms. So I think there's no doubt epigenetic mechanisms play important roles to stabilize um, cellular state, um, uh, chromatin, um, uh, chromatin folding. But uh, what comes first, I think, uh, genetic. Uh, coded information uh, that reside in these repetitive sequences. Um, yeah. I'm not sure <laughs> my answer is yeah. satisfactory. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? I would I would be happy to ask. Um, Iran, please. Yes, it was fabulous. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. So you started with uh, embryonic stem cells, and I was wondering. Uh, about the, the nuclear architecture specific in embryonic stem cells of the L1 and B1 and how that would change in differentiation and specifically regarding to their expression, whether these, you see uh, their expression in embryonic stem cells, uh, you know, maybe um, higher than in differentiated cells and how this expression would, would change during differentiation and affect nuclear architecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Yura. Uh, that's a fantastic question. Um, yes, uh, L1 expression uh, expressed in higher level in embryonic stem cells compared to differentiated cells. Um, um, uh, but um, I, I, um, I, I think, because we look at different cell types, uh, we look at the neuronal stem cells, uh, we also look at the uh, uh, fibroblast, um, uh, this all pattern, they are all similar. So we, I don't know whether high level expression of L1, um, L1 RNA in ES cells um, have additional loads compared, um, contribute to um, the genome organization or, or basal expression level of L1 should be enough to maintain this structure. So that I don't know. And uh, we, uh, I also don't know, because uh, L1, it's silenced, it's most of them sequestered in B compartment, it should be silenced. So how L1 RNA play a role, um, I, I don't know. And, and how about phase separation? Do you, do you see any changes in the phase separation properties of the L1 in, in embryonic stem cell differentiation? because of the higher expression, maybe? Um, so we haven't been um, able to probe um, L1-mediated phase separation in vivo in cells. 
and uh, we only did experiment in vitro okay. L1A um, have a high affinity with HP1 alpha yes. and the face that in vivo, um, I haven't figured out a way to do it. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> if you have any idea, I'm happy to hear. Yeah, maybe we can talk offline. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? No other questions. Okay, so what we're going to do now, uh, we're going to take a one minute break in order to see what you are hopefully going to be able to see in October when you arrive to Tel Aviv. And then we'll continue with the second part of our symposium today and Iran Mishore will take over as chair. So give me a moment. I'm going to share my screen with you and show you something that I think is very exciting. Okay, so I hope that that whets your appetite a little bit for the very exciting scientific conference that we're going to be holding here in October 4th through 6th. And as more and more of you are getting vaccinated and certainly the rest of the world, we hope that we'll be able to have that conference as planned. So Professor Shen, thank you again very much. Your talk was remarkable. And Iran, why don't you take over for the next one? Thank you, Karen. So I'm happy to introduce uh, the next two speakers. Um, we'll start with uh, Uri Ben David. Uh, Uri Ben David is an assistant professor of cancer genetics at Tel Aviv University. Uh, Dr. Ben David obtained his PhD from the Hebrew University and completed his postdoctoral training at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. His lab now focuses on a fundamental understudied trait of cancer called aneuploidy, a change in the number of chromosomes in cancer cells. The Ben David lab applies a variety of experimental and computational approaches to studying the biological processes that lead to aneuploidy, deciphering the selection pressures that shape aneuploidy evolution during tumorigenesis and developing novel strategies to selectively target aneuploid cancer cells. Ultimately, his research aspires to expand the understanding of the genetic basis of cancer and to open new avenues for personalized cancer treatments. Dr. Ben David is the recipient of several prestigious grants and awards, including the 2020 AACR Next Generation Star Award and the 2020 ERC Starting Grant. And Uri, we look forward um, to your talk. Please share the screen. And the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Iran, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this uh, exciting uh, virtual Hugo meeting. Um, in my lab at Tel Aviv University, we study cancer genetics, uh, focusing on a relatively understudied trait of cancer, as Iran said, its imbalanced chromosome number, a condition known as aneuploidy. Our normal somatic cells have two sets of chromosomes, one that we inherit from our father and one that we inherit from our mother and misaggregation of chromosomes occurs frequently in cancer. And this was first observed over a century ago now by Theodore Bovary and Marcella O'Grady Bovary. And this is what a chromosome misaggregation looks like using modern microscopy. The outcome of chromosome misaggregation is an imbalanced number of chromosomes in the cell, the phenomenon that we know as aneuploidy. Aneuploidy is a hallmark of cancer, about 90% of solid tumors and three quarters of hematologic malignancies are aneuploid. On average, 
over 25% of the cancer genome is affected by aneuploidy, more than is affected by any other type of genetic alteration. Aneuploidy is a fascinating phenomenon because it is mostly embryonic lethal and it has detrimental consequences during development. Yet it is a characteristic feature of cancer cells. And this has become to be known as the aneuploidy paradox. I became interested in studying aneuploidy as a PhD student with Nisim Benvenisti at the Hebrew University. We found that stem cells tend to acquire the same aneuploidies that characterize tumors of the same tissue origin. This suggests that the fitness advantage of specific aneuploidies depends on the cellular context. We also found that the most common aneuploidy in pluripotent stem cells, trisomy of chromosome 12, can increase the proliferation and tumorigenicity of the cells. So in some contexts, a single aneuploidy can be tumor promoting. In my postdoc with Todd Golub at the Broad Institute, we found distinct patterns of aneuploidy across cancer types. Here you can see gains in red and losses in blue. In glioblastoma, for example, there are recurrent gains of chromosome 7 and losses of chromosome 10. Each tumor type has its own unique pattern of aneuploidies. This does not necessarily mean that these events drive cancer, but it is consistent with positive selection for specific aneuploidies during tumor genesis. Aneuploidy, however, remains an elephant in the cancer research room. We still lack mechanistic understanding of its roles in cancer initiation and progression. And maybe most importantly, we still lack therapies that directly target a, this a, a, a hallmark of a cancer and makes use of the fundamental difference between normal cells and cancer cells in order to eliminate tumors. A major reason for that is that aneuploidy is challenging to study. By definition, it encompasses multiple genes as there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of genetic elements on each human chromosome. It is context specific, as I've already explained, and it is hard to model. Even today in the CRISPR era, it's far from trivial to introduce or remove chromosomes or chromosome arms into and from cells. At the same time, aneuploidy provides a unique lens into tumor evolution, because at the cellular level, it is a discrete event. A cell is either euploid or aneuploid, unlike gene expression or methylation, for example. It is also unique to cancer cells, as normal cells in our body are by large diploid. And finally, aneuploidy can be determined using various methods, from traditional cytogenetics to microarrays to DNA and RNA sequencing. Today, I would like to discuss how, by studying aneuploidy at scale and in the appropriate cellular context, we can gain insights into its role in tumor initiation and progression and identify cellular vulnerabilities associated with this genomic phenomenon. In a first study already published a few years ago, we characterized the aneuploidy landscapes of genetically engineered mouse models and revealed a driver-specific pattern of aneuploidy. We observed marked differences in aneuploidy patterns across mouse memory tumors that were initiated with distinct drivers. For example, breast cancer induced by p53 inactivation is associated with widespread aneuploidy in multiple chromosomes, whereas breast cancer induced by HER2 amplification is associated with a specific aneuploidy. We took advantage of these recurrence patterns in order to narrow down the region of interest in one of the most recurrent chromosomal changes in human breast cancer. Here's how it goes. We found that hair 2 induced memory tumors tend to lose a copy of mouse chromosome 4. Mouse chromosome 4 is synthetic to four human chromosomes, among which only the short arm of human chromosome 1 is recurrently lost in human memory tumors of the hair 2 enriched subtype. So if we assume that the same gene or set of genes underlie the recurrence of this loss in both species, we can narrow down the region of interest and then use gene expression patterns of orthologs in order to identify and then validate a tumor suppressor gene that cooperates with HER2 during tumor genesis. In another study, we followed aneuploidy evolution in patient-derived xenografts. These models are taken from an immune-competent human environment and transplanted into immune-deficient mice, often subcutaneously. 
So we suspected that this might change the selection pressures and consequently the aneuploidy landscapes of the tumors. We collected genomic data from over 500 PDX models. And we found that in 90% of the models, very few passages were sufficient for the emergence or disappearance of aneuploidy. Interestingly, the rate of changes was similar between PDXs and freshly derived cell lines. Our study was recently challenged by the work of Wu and colleagues who profiled the copy number of hundreds of primary tumors and their matched PDXs and reached the conclusion that the copy number profiles are highly conserved. Wu et al. used Pearson's correlations as their main measure of similarity. Here, for example, you can see each PDX, that each PDX is most similar to the primary tumor from which it was derived, as one might expect. However, we've recently reanalyzed the DNA copy number data from Wu et al. And we found that it corroborated our original analysis. A median of over 10% of the genome was altered between primary tumors and their matched PDXs. And much of this difference was due to differential aneuploidies. Moreover, in cohorts that had primary tumors and PDXs from two different passages, the higher passage PDX was significantly less similar to the primary tumor than the earlier passage PDX, in line with model evolution. We therefore think that the difference between our conclusion and that of Wu al. is due to the different ways in which we define similarity and dissimilarity and the different interpretation of these results. What can we learn about aneuploidy as a driver of tumorogenesis from the fact that some aneuploidies can gradually disappear when the tumor is transferred to the mouse environment? While recurrent aneuploidies can play a driving role, they are not essential for most tumors since subclones without them do exist. However, it's important to note that this doesn't mean that they don't drive tumorogenesis, as we often see subclonal driver mutations as well. It also teaches, teaches us about the importance of context. The fitness of aneuploidy depends on the cellular context. Unlike point mutations that mostly have a neutral adaptive value, aneuploidy mostly has a negative adaptive value. And therefore, when environmental conditions change, the likelihood that it would be selected against become high. We next turn to human cancer cell lines, the workhorse of cancer research. In a study that we published a couple of years ago, we documented the genomic evolution of cancer cell lines and showed how their diversification led to phenotypic consequences, including disparate drug response. In a follow-up study, we recently found that the evolution of the cell lines is not random, but can be determined by experimental interventions. When Cas9 is expressed in cell lines, even in the absence of a guide RNA, the P53 pathway is activated. And this promotes the selection for P53 in activating mutations. This in turn can lead to greater aneuploidy tolerance and genetic instability in the cell lines. One of the outcomes of these studies is that we can identify strains of the same human cell line with and without specific recurrent aneuploidies. For example, loss of chromosome 17 is the most common aneuploidy in breast cancer. Some MCF7 strains have lost this arm, whereas others retain it. The strains that have lost it have the expected reduction in gene expression of the genes that reside on chromosome 17p. So this can serve as an isogenic-like system to interrogate the functional consequences of this aneuploidy as we are currently doing. In my lab, we're applying genomic and functional tools to the research of cancer aneuploidy. And one of the major questions that we're asking is what are the selection pressures that shape the aneuploidy landscapes of cancers and therefore shape the uh, genomes of uh, uh, the tumors? I've already mentioned the importance of the microenvironment when I described the PDX uh, studies. But what about the genomic context on which aneuploidy emerges? How do specific mutations and other genetic alterations affect the fitness of aneuploidy? Of particular interest is all genome duplication, an event that occurs in about one third of human tumors. In a recent study, we compared the aneuploidy patterns of cancers that have undergone whole genome duplication to those that have not, using clinical genomic data from the Cancer Genome Atlas. We found that whole genome duplication 
made tumor cells more susceptible to aneuploidy in general and was associated with unique patterns of aneuploidy. Importantly, the adaptive value of specific chromosomal interactions was affected uh, uh, by, by this uh, uh, whole genome duplication. For example, events that tend to co-occur in cancers that have not been through whole genome duplication can become mutually exclusive following whole genome duplication. In another line of research, we're trying to identify the genes that drive the recurrence of specific common aneuploidies. We apply experimental and computational tools to dissect genomic, functional, and clinical data from patients and from models in order to identify, prioritize, and validate drivers of common aneuploidies. The third line of research in the lab is the selective targeting of aneuploid cells. We try to tackle this challenge from two complementary perspectives. On one end, we want to identify Achilles heels of specific recurrent aneuploidies. On the other hand, we want to reveal vulnerabilities of highly aneuploid cells, regardless of the specific chromosome that is affected. The long-term goal here is to devise strategies to kill cancer cells by targeting the consequences of the abnormal number of chromosomes. An example of the first approach is coming from a study led by Stephen Corsello from Todd Golub's group. In this study, we screened a, a, a FDA-approved drugs against hundreds of cell lines using a DNA barcoding approach. We observed an association between the status of the long arm of chromosome 16 and the response to the drug disulfiram. Interestingly, disulfiram is a metal chelator, and chromosome 16Q harbors a cluster of methylothionine genes, which are metal binding proteins important for metal homeostasis. We validated that knockdown of MTF1, the main regulator of this cluster, sensitizes the cells to this drug. What about the other side of the spectrum then? Multiple studies have shown that a high degree of aneuploidy is associated with poor prognosis and drug resistance in cancer patients. In a recent collaboration led by Angelica Amon from MIT, we demonstrated that slower cell division is one way by which aneuploidy increases the resistance of cancer cells to chemotherapies. However, work from multiple labs has shown in recent years that aneuploidy also elicits a variety of cellular stresses that are independent of the specific affected chromosomes. These include mitotic, replication, proteotoxic, and metabolic stresses. The question then is whether we can also find increased drug sensitivities that are induced by aneuploidy and would allow us to selectively eliminate aneuploid cells. So we wanted to ask whether high levels of aneuploidy might, might make cancer cells more susceptible to some genetic or chemical perturbations. To examine that, we turn to the Broad Institute Cancer Dependency Map, which provides a unique resource to link genomic features with cellular dependencies. However, this resource did not include information about the aneuploidy landscapes of the cancer cell lines at the time. To fill this gap, we followed an approach that was previously applied to human tumors, and we assigned aneuploidy scores to about 1,000 human cancer cell lines. Here, for example, you can see a subset of breast cancer cell lines that are highly aneuploid, as is shown by the gains in red and the losses in blue, and another subset of breast cancer cell lines that are euploid. This classification allowed us to compare the genetic and pharmacological dependencies between the near euploid and the highly aneuploid cell lines in an attempt to identify Achilles heels of aneuploid cancer cells. We found increased sensitivity of aneuploid cancer cells to the genetic perturbation of MED2 and bab b two core members of the spindle assembly checkpoint. These findings immediately draw our attention since the spindle assembly checkpoint, also known as the mitotic checkpoint, is the major mechanism by which cells ensure the proper segregation of chromosomes during mitosis. The SAC proteins are responsible for delaying the transition from metaphase to anaphase until all chromosomes achieve bipolar orientation in the mitotic spindle. It's been known for many years that SAC inhibition could lead to chromosomal instability and aneuploidy, and that this can result in tumorigenesis. But what we found suggests that the opposite direction may be true as well. Aneuploid cells may be more dependent on the SAC activity than euploid cells. 
Using several isogenic models of near diploid and aneuploid cancer cells, we confirmed that the aneuploid cells were indeed more sensitive to SAC inhibition. Interestingly, we found that initially, the aneuploid cells actually seemed more resistant, and their increased sensitivity was only manifested after prolonged SAC inhibition. These findings suggest that aneuploid cancer cells may overcome SAC inhibition more readily than diploid cells, but the resultant aberrant cells exhibit severe proliferative defects. We therefore followed the karyotypic evolution of the cells upon SAC inhibition using single cell DNA sequencing. In these plots, <clears throat> each row represents a single cell and each column represents a chromosome. As expected prior to treatment, both the karyotypic heterogeneity and the degree of aneuploidy were higher in the aneuploid cells compared to the near diploid cells. At day three of SAC inhibition, all cells were chromosomally unstable, but the resultant heterogeneity was significantly higher in the aneuploid cell lines. After two weeks of exposure and drug removal, the surviving cells in the near diploid populations had the same near diploid karyotype and low karyotypic variation as that seen in the untreated cells, suggesting that the original near diploid karyotype was more fit than the aneuploid karyotypes induced by the drug. By contrast, in the aneuploid populations, the fewer surviving cells had highly aneuploid and heterogeneous karyotypes. These results suggest that the euploid cells can overcome the prolonged drug treatment, whereas the aneuploid cells cannot select for a fit karyotype. In line with these findings, live cell microscopy imaging confirmed that aneuploid cells exhibited more mitotic aberrations when treated with SAC inhibitors. These aberrations included micronuclei formation, failed cytokinesis, and multipolar spindles. We also noticed that the spindle geometry and dynamics were altered in aneuploid cells. We found that one specific kinesin motor protein, KIF18A, was significantly more essential in the aneuploid cells and was associated with the abnormal spindle structure that we identified. I won't get, get into all of the molecular details for lack of time. Finally, we were able to causally link the activity of KIF18A to the dependency on the SEC using a rescue assay. To summarize, we characterized the molecular and cellular origins of the differential sensitivity of diploid and aneuploid cells to inhibition of the spindle assembly checkpoint. We propose a model in which diploid cells have a normal structure and arrest in mitosis upon SAC inhibition, resulting in relatively few mitotic aberrations, which they can eventually overcome. In aneuploid cells, in contrast, the spindle structure is abnormal. When SAC is, inhib is inhibited, the cells can quickly overcome the mitotic arrest, which makes it seem more resistant to the inhibition at first. However, these cells acquire multiple mitotic aberrations, which eventually results in their proliferation arrest and cell death. So we've added the aneuploidy profiles of the thousand cell lines that we characterized to the dependency map, making them an available genomic feature for the community. So I would like to end here by thanking my lab members and especially the people who took part in the studies that I shared with you today, Yael, Kavya, and Michal. We're always looking for excellent PhD students and postdocs, and at the moment we're particularly looking for computational students and postdocs, so come and speak to me or write to me if you're interested. I would also like to thank the funding agencies that support our research and the multiple collaborators on the various projects that I discussed today. Todd Golub, Ramin Berukim, James McFarland and their teams at the Broad Institute and Dana Fargo Cancer Institute, Gavin Ha and Anna Hoge from the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, Jason Stamps, Stamp and his team at the University of Vermont, Zuzana Storchova and her team at the University of Kaiserslautern, Daniela Cimini and their team at Virginia Tech, Stefano Santaguida and his team at the University of Milano, and Floris Foyer and his team at the University of Groningen. Last but not least, I would like to also thank my mentor, collaborator and friend, Professor Angelica Amon. Angelica tragically passed away just a few months ago, but her groundbreaking work on aneuploidy keeps inspiring us and many others in the field. So thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Uri. Fascinating talk and thank you for mentioning uh, Angelica Amon. Um,
Yes, she was a dear colleague to many of us and a terrible loss to the scientific community. Um, questions, I'll start by reading one from the chat. Um, so the question is, uh, how to validate an aploidy event in cancer tissue or cell line when the aneuploidy or whole genome duplication was previously identified using whole genome sequencing? Okay, so basically you can look at the depth, basically the read depth, and in the vast, vast majority of cases, uh, genomes that have been through whole genome uh, duplication do not remain exactly tetraploid. So they tend to gain and lose chromosomes. So you would not get a, 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 an identical signal throughout the genome. You would have a chromosomes and chromosome arms that do not a, a, a share the ploidy of the rest of the, of the genome, and you can take advantage of that to tell the difference. Thank you. Are there other questions? I don't see any. I have a quick one. Um, so you showed us in the beginning of your talk that uh, each cancer type has a distinct kind of uh, an aploidy pattern. And I was wondering still whether you find things that that are common to the different cancer types that, that, that would kind of lead to a, a, a mechanistic way of obtaining some kind of advantage. Yes, it's, it's a great question and a, and, a, and a tough one. So there are really each tumor type and not just tumor type. We show that even, and others have shown that even within specific subtypes are characterized by specific chromosomal changes. There are chromosomes that tend to be lost or tend to be gained. It's almost never in 100% of the tumor types, but it could be a majority of, of, the, ty of the types. For example, a, 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 a chromosome 17Q tend to be gained or chromosome 13 tend to be lost. However, I'm not sure that we would find kind of a holistic or a uniform mechanism that uh, in terms of the, the, the driver forces uh, of aneuploidy, because I think that we, in, in many ways, we should think about it like we think of point mutations. The, so chromosomal instability, like genomic instability, it you know, increases the substrate for evolution and therefore has a general tumorigenic role, but then specific events can alter the, 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 the biology of the cell in very specific circumstances, the, the, the right tissue type, the right developmental stage, the right genomic context. And only under these circumstances would a specific chromosomal change really have a, 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 a selective advantage. So we really need to basically take that into account. And I think that part of the challenge in the field, and it has been the case for many years, is that when we try to model aneuploidy, and for example, if we just introduce aneuploidy exogenously to cells, then often it has detrimental consequences. So, so we're missing either components that really a, a enable cells to tolerate aneuploidy, or we don't model properly the, the cellular context. So this is something that I think the field now has come to recognize, and we and many others are trying to work on improving the models to make them more relevant to, to studying what actually happens in, in the context of aneuploidy evolution in, in cancer. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um... Okay, so one last question in the chat by Dan Mishmar. Do any of the candidate genes identified to underlie the specific chromosomal change also play a role in changes in ploidy and aberrations during the course of evolution? Um, okay, yeah, that's a good question. So in some cases, we definitely think that they do. The best example for that is P53. P53 is the mutations are associated with aneuploidy and with whole genome duplication. And of course, inactivation of P53 basically sets the ground in many cases for aneuploidy evolution. And at the same time, P53 is, is a driver event. So one major, major mechanism for inactivating P53 is actually through aneuploidy, through the loss of the entire chromosome arm on which this gene resides, chromosome 17P. Uh, so I think this would be a good, or oh, apart from, I see now in the chat that Dan is saying apart from P53. So the problem with, with other genes is that a, a, um, we, no other single gene is uniformly associated 
with aneuploidy in a very in a robust, significant way across all cancer types. In specific cancers, we do think that this is the case. Uh, even the genes that I mentioned, for example, the spindle assembly checkpoint genes, right? So they are uh, not commonly mutated in cancer at, at, at all, but they tend to, their expression tends to, to change. They probably due to non-genetic uh, mechanisms. And these are genes that, as we, we, we also show, they, they, they both enable aneuploidy and they could potentially be drivers of specific uh, uh, um, uh, changes. Uh, but again, this is not a, such a strong case as the case of P53. So in many cases, I think this would be the, the answer to that would be a tumor type specific rather than a pan cancer uh, uh, um, gene. Okay, Uri, thank you very much again. We'll have to move thank on. Um, and we are moving to Gilly Greenbaum, uh, our final speaker of this afternoon session. Um, so Dr. Gilly Greenbaum is an assistant professor studying population genomics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Gilly began his career studying mathematics at the Hebrew U continued to a PhD in physics and ecology at Ben Gurion University, followed by a postdoc at Stanford University. Gilly has worked on diverse topics in evolution and genetics, from mathematical modeling of co-evolutionary dynamics to evolutionary interactions between Neanderthals and modern humans, and to conservation genomics of endangered species. Gilly's lab is studying how evolutionary potential is represented in the genomes of populations and how eco-evolutionary processes shape genomic diversities. They are developing computational tools for analyzing large genomic data sets, and they are formulating models for investigating population genetic dynamics. One of the main focus of his lab is to expand the scopes of conservation biology to in incorporate genomic thinking, and they are actively working on genomics of various threatened species, such as tigers and howler monkeys. Today, Gilly will be telling us about his work on interface of human population structure and its multiple hierarchical levels. Please, Gilly, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Iran, for the introduction. Um, and thanks uh, to the organizers for, for inviting me. So um, as Iran said, um, I will be uh, talking about population genetics today. And in population genetics, we like to think about populations as these pools of genes and forces like natural selection, mutation, recombination, acting on these uh, gene pools to change their uh, composition through uh, uh, time. And a salient uh, feature of, of many of these gene pools in, in populations is that they are not uh, homogeneous, but rather they are uh, uh, structured and uh, there are uh, subpopulations within a population, and many of the important evolutionary and ecological processes occur within uh, these uh, units, these uh, subpopulation units, and there are other processes that, uh, like gene flow, that affect the interaction of these uh, um, subpopulations. So we can't think about a population as one homogeneous gene pool most of the time, and to complicate things, there are different uh, levels in which we can think about uh, population structure. So some processes might be occurring on one particular uh, partition of the population into subpopulation, but maybe there's another process that's occurring at a different level with a different set of interactions between uh, subpopulations. So we need to think not only of population, single level of population structure, but we have multiple hierarchical levels of population structure shaping the composition of gene pools. So uh, a common task that we are uh, often confronted with is uh, to infer population structure from genomic information. So we are uh, uh, given a, a sample of genomes from a population. Uh, and uh, what we would like to be able to do is to sort of partition or cluster these, uh, these individuals, individual genomes into uh, groups that correspond to these uh, uh, population genetic processes that are shaping the variation of the population. And uh, we do this uh, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, we, if you we want to describe genetic variation in a population, we need to be able to, to, uh, to partition it to the relevant uh, units. 
so in order to delineate groups and uh, uh, further discuss particular uh, uh, population structure groups, we need to be able to describe the genetic variation. Uh, it's also an important uh, piece uh, when we're trying to use population genetics to understand historical and uh, evolutionary processes. So we are uh, studying the different units in the population, the gene flow of these units, units admixture uh, and uh, uh, local adaptations and these sort of processes. We also need uh, uh, to infer population structure when we are interested in sort of downstream analysis like uh, GWAS analyses. Uh, we want to make sure that if we are finding associations between particular genes and particular traits, that we are not uh, um, actually looking at associations that are caused because of population structure. So in order to co correct downstream analysis, we also need to infer population structure. And uh, the entire field of uh, ecological genetics uh, sort of relies on the sort of uh, inference of population structure uh, methods uh, in order to uh, uh, understand the ecology of populations through looking at their uh, genetics. So because this is a really uh, important uh, uh, task to do to infer population structure, there's been a lot of uh, uh, interest in developing uh, uh, strong methods for inferring population structure. And uh, uh, there are two main types of uh, approaches. One is a sort of PCA-like approach or multidimensional scaling approach, where we visualize this really multidimensional data. So we have a lot of individuals and a lot of uh, genetic markers for each individual. We're trying to visualize this multidimensional data on two or three dimensions and use this to sort of identify uh, main groups. Uh, a very powerful approach is the, the model-based clustering approach uh, in programs like structure or admixture, where what you do is you, you predefine a, a model of, of a set of populations and some, uh, some uh, features of the model. And then you try to um, parameterize the model using things like Bayesian clustering, uh, which uh, using the genetic information. So you define a model, you look at the genetic information, and you try to uh, parameterize the model, which is the association of individuals to uh, populations. These are very strong uh, approaches, but they, uh, the one thing that they lack is this multidimensional uh, aspects of population structure. They, they are not very good at uh, helping us uh, see that multidimensionality. So what we wanted to do is to see if we can develop a, a method uh, or set of methods that allow us to capture multiple hierarchical levels of population structure simultaneously. So giving us all the contexts of population structure uh, uh, in one sort of a, a scheme. We want to be able to look at very fine scales of population structure. So as we are getting more and more uh, genetic resolution, uh, we are starting to see finer and finer scale of population structure. So we really were interested in seeing how far can we go with revealing these very fine scale levels of population structure. And uh, we also wanted to develop uh, methods that are uh, more data driven. So we want to rely on uh, as few as possible biological assumptions uh, or models uh, when we, we start our inference, so as not to bias the results with uh, some uh, pre presumption. And the direction that we decided to go is to uh, look at uh, network-based clustering approaches uh, and use uh, um, um, sort of advancement in the field of uh, network science in the last few years to see if we can use this uh, perspective to, to conduct uh, uh, multiple hierarchical level inference of population structure. So uh, how does this, uh, this idea work? Um, what, we, what we first do is we first we construct a network where the nodes of the network are the different individuals in the population, or more precisely, the genomes of the different individuals in the population. So these are the nodes the points that we want to connect in order to construct a network. And the, the next thing that we do is we, we define a, um, 
uh, a measure of similarity between each pairs of genomes in the population. And we do this by considering two things. We consider the genotypes of these particular uh, individuals, but we also consider uh, the allele frequency in the population. And the idea is that if two individuals share a very rare allele, that uh, tells us more about whether or not they're in a particular uh, subpopulation than if they share a very uh, a common allele. So we use both these sets of, uh, of uh, information and we design which we can now compute between all pairs of individuals in the, the population to generate a rather complex structure, which is a network that describes or encodes a lot of the relevant genetic information for inferring a, a population structure. So uh, we look at these sort of networks where uh, the, these two individuals here, they're connected by a thick edge. This means that they share uh, many alleles or that they share very rare alleles. These two individuals here, they are connected by a, a thin edge, meaning that they share few alleles or share very uh, common alleles. So this uh, sort of a network is, is rather complex uh, structure to, to study. So the first thing we, we did is we tried to simplify it by removing some of the weaker edges uh, from the network in a process that is called edge pruning. So we're removing the weak edges that do not convey a lot of information about population structure. We remove some more of the edges. And what you start seeing uh, happening is that these groups of nodes uh, that are very strongly connected uh, within themselves start to emerge from the network. So we have these groups of nodes, these dense substructures in the network start popping out and we are able to identify them and characterize them. This process is called community detection. This is a very uh, active field of research in, in uh, network science. And we are using, uh, uh, like I've said, uh, things that are going on in network science in order to uh, take algorithms for detecting and, and looking at these uh, dense substructures. So we look at these dense substructures and we equate them with uh, uh, subpopulations in order to uh, infer the population structure of our population. So uh, let's look at some data. Um, this is a very low resolution uh, uh, analysis from 22,000 SNPs from the HapMap project. Uh, so we're looking at human, human populations. Each dot here is, a, is a one individual and the colors are the result of this uh, network analysis. So we identify six different clusters in this network, which correspond uh, to uh, Africa, Europe, Mexico, uh, India, China, and Japan. Uh, and uh, that's, th this is really nice. This is another me method for inferring population structure. Uh, it's very data-driven. We did not design any uh, model or assumptions uh, in doing so, and that's very nice. But what we uh, wanted to, to look at is how, how does this process of edge pruning, so getting from this very dense network to the, the network where we are able to identify a fine population structure, what happens along this process of edge pruning? What happens if we sort of look at the population structure in each one of these levels of, uh, of edge pruning? And what we see is that at the first level, so when we start the edge pruning and we apply these algorithms, uh, the first partition that pops up is a partition to Africa and non-African individuals. And then if we continue on with this analysis, we, we get a, a second partition emerges, Africa, Indo-Europe, and East Asian. And only if we continue with the edge pruning, then the last partition pops up. So, we, we saw that during looking at this edge pruning process, what we actually see is that there are different, different stages of the process, there are different levels of population structure that we are uh, uh, observing. And if we, uh, instead of looking at the final result, we look at the entire edge pruning process, we sort of get a, 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 in one process and uh, an observation of all the different hierarchical levels of structure. So none of these, levels of structure is, is the right one. They are all there in the data uh, and they are all important for different perspective or looking at different uh, processes. 
uh, but we want to sort of generate a method that's, that will allow us to um, look at this data uh, uh, in more detail. So we've we developed a method that uh, takes advantage or capitalizes on this idea of edge pruning, where we uh, uh, um, sort of continue this edge pruning process. And as we go along, we're uh, uh, removing, removing edges and looking at the clusters, uh, the, the network clusters that uh, emerge. And uh, we use this to construct something that we call a population structure tree, which is sort of a hierarchical representation of a uh, population structure where each one of the nodes of this tree is actually a cluster. So it's a set of, of genomes uh, and the relations of the genomes uh, are described in the tree. And the, the topology of this tree, so the shape of this tree is generated, totally generated by the data itself. So there's nothing in the, in the uh, method that defines how the topology uh, should, should look like uh, uh, of this population structure tree. Uh, you can think of it as something that, that resembles a phylogeny uh, uh, in the sense that there, it's a genetic relation between individuals, but there's no assumption about any ev particular evolutionary process that is generating it. In population genetics, we have a sum of, uh, of forces that shape the genetic compositions, and the, 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 the outcome of, it, of all these processes is this uh, hierarchical representation of population structure. So with this new method that describes multiple hierarchical levels, we went to a larger uh, human uh, data set called the Human Genome Diversity Project. Uh, this is a very, very nice data set that uh, uh, sampled many, many different populations from all over the world, more than 50 different uh, populations. And when we uh, reconstruct the population structure tree of the Human Genome Diversity Project, we get something uh, like this. So the topology of this particular tree, again, is generated by the data itself. Uh, and we color, we color code this uh, tree in a way that uh, uh, similar colors represent uh, clusters that are closer on the population structure tree. Now, if we look at the main branches of the coarse scale of structure uh, in, in this uh, representation, we see that it corresponds to the main uh, sort of uh, almost continents. Uh, we have the Americas, we have East Asia, we have Oceania and so on. Uh, and we have sort of the relations between these different uh, main regions in the main branches of the population structure tree. Now, if we start focusing on the, on the leaves of the tree, so the very fine scale population structure at the bottom of this uh, tree, uh, we see that we are uh, able to identify very uh, subtle differentiation patterns between uh, uh, populations. So almost all the populations in the Human Genome Diversity Project can be assigned to a single or several leaves uh, in, in, in this uh, tree. Uh, and we are able to see uh, sort of in one uh, representation, both the very fine scale structure that is revealed and also the context, the context of the coarser or higher hierarchical levels of population uh, structure. So we can, we can study sort of this uh, visualization and this tree and understand why we get this particular relations between uh, the populations and why uh, some populations have particular uh, interesting behaviors like Pima appears in two branches of the tree uh, that are really far apart. That's an interesting feature that we can study and it says something about the Pima population. But uh, we can also uh, try and visualize or go back to the geographic maps and visualize this uh, population structure tree on geographic uh, maps. So what you see here are uh, all the different uh, populations of the Human Genome Diversity Project. See that the, the black circles and all the dots are the different uh, individuals. They are colored according to the, the population structure tree. And uh, now we can sort of uh, select a particular branch that we want to focus on and then recolor uh, the individuals in this particular branch with our uh, coloring method. And what you can see uh, happening is that when we focus on a particular tree, we start seeing very fine scale levels of differentiation. For example, uh, uh, 
Mandeka Europa, Biaka, and Nabuti are populations that are very difficult to differentiate genetically in other methods. Uh, and we see here that we are really able to differentiate them uh, very well. Uh, the same thing here in, in northern China, uh, populations that are sort of very similar and also look very similar when you look at it from a, the coarse scale of population structure. When you observe the fine scale or closer to the leaves, then you see that they are, uh, you are able to genetically differentiate them using this method. We've explored different uh, parts of the world, looking at particular uh, uh, sub branches of the tree, again and again, seeing that we're able to, uh, to observe fine scale partitions. Some of them we can uh, relate to historical events and some of them are just interesting in, in themselves. So um, we're able to say a lot about population structure using this network uh, approach. But one thing that we were interested in is exactly how much information, uh, how much genetic information do you need in order to, to really reveal all these details about population structure? So do you need to look at the entire genome? Can we use a sub sample of the genome? Is that enough to uh, infer population structure at this level? So we've developed an um, uh, information theoretic measure uh, and, and normalized mutual information, which basically measures the similarity of different population structure trees. And then we subsample the, the genome uh, to generate uh, population structure trees based on uh, low resolution or lower resolution uh, uh, genetic information. And compared them with the full population structure tree. And what we see is that uh, uh, need, we need about, you know, the first uh, tens of thousands of SNPs of the genome are, in, are really give us a lot of information about population structures. This is the, the jump that you see with a few tens of thousands of SNPs. But as you increase the genetic content that you are sampling, you gain, you, you gain more and more information about population structure. Uh, you can see this when you look at all the heretical levels together, uh, and it, it's even more, uh, uh, you gain more information when we think about fine scale, scale structure. So if you're interested in fine scale structure, uh, the more SNPs you sample, the more information uh, you gain. Now, this was not an obvious result, and we wanted to see does this happen in, in other species? So we have uh, did the same exercise with uh, Arabidopsis uh, taliana, which is a, it's a model uh, plant species, but it's also widespread all over the world. And uh, we've analyzed this uh, genetic information from Arabidopsis taliana. This is the population structure tree of Arabidopsis taliana. Uh, you can see that just looking at the topology of this tree and this tree, that they are very different. So with Arabidopsis taliana, the tree is very unbalanced. You have the left main branch has only one uh, node while the right main branch has like 250 nodes. This, we think this reflects the, the history of Arabidopsis taliana, especially in the Americas. So there's no hierarchical population structure in the Americas and a lot of uh, levels of population structure uh, in Euro-Asia and Africa. Uh, and this we think reflects the fact that Arabidopsis taliana is, is a recent invader to North America, whereas humans invaded North America a bit uh, uh, earlier. And if we look at the, the same analysis of information gain for Arabidopsis taliana, we see that again, a few tens of thousands of SNPs are enough for uh, gaining most of the information about population structure, but that these, these plots saturate uh, very quickly. So with Arabidopsis taliana, we see that adding more SNPs does not give you more information about uh, population uh, structure. Now, we don't know why uh, this, this is the case for Arabidopsis taliana and not for, for humans. We're very much interested in sort of investigating further what's going on here. Why are there, why, why in humans do we keep on getting information about population structure and uh, not in, in other species? Um, we are also interested to see maybe there's some uh, particular parts of the genome that are particularly informative or or particular classes of alleles that are particularly informative. 
and we are uh, continuing and exploring this direction. So um, to summarize sort of what, um, what I've shown you uh, to now. Oh, so first of all, all these methods uh, are, are available in software. Uh, uh, there's also the visualization of the maps and so on in these two software called Netstruct and Netstruct hierarchy. You are uh, welcome to uh, use them, of course. So we've seen that human population structure has uh, multiple hierarchical levels, and we, we are able to use uh, data-driven network methods in order to uh, uh, observe these multiple levels of structure in one uh, analysis. We also saw that in humans, there is an increase in information contact content with more uh, SNPs, but we don't see this uh, with uh, Arabidopsis uh, Italian. So I want to thank the, the, the collaborators and the people that I've worked with on these uh, uh, different projects. Uh, Amir Rubin is a postdoc in my lab. Alan Templeton is uh, from Washington University, Noah Rosenberg from Stanford, and Shirley Bardafid from uh, Ben Gurnior University. And uh, I would also like to add, as Uri did, that we are uh, recruiting. And if you're interested in uh, population genetics, please uh, uh, feel free to, uh, um, to contact me. So uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, Gilly. Thank you very much. Exciting. So again, we'll start by reading one of the questions from the uh, chat. So environmental interaction is very important to know the population structure. How can we formulate the model by using different state variables to explore the effect of genetic complexity of the various population? Mm -hmm. That's a difficult question. Um, we are often trying to escape doing that um, because it is complex. Um, we have started doing this in particular cases. Uh, for example, I'll go back one, two, three slides. With the Rabidopsis uh, Italiana, we saw this interesting pattern where North Sweden um, is more similar to Asia and Africa than it is to the rest of Europe. Uh, and we started thinking uh, maybe there's some um, uh, local adaptation processes going on, uh, or maybe it's a, a result of a sampling bias and so on. So I think in order to, to really um, answer these questions, we need to first have a good understanding of population structure to give us ideas where to look for environmental impacts on population structure. And when we, once we have identified those, we can sort of dig in into the genetics of these particular populations and try and see if we can pin down uh, uh, what processes, local adaptation processes or some other processes are, uh, are, are driving these uh, signals. So it's, it's, a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult question to answer and we can answer them for particular cases and probably not for at least not yet for sort of general uh, analyses. Giri, what about the SNP, uh, uh, SNP numbers or concentrations between uh, Arabidopsis and humans? Could this explain some of the differences that you see in the, uh, in the slopes, in the information that you gather? Um, well, it doesn't explain what we've seen because we've we've made sure that we were sam we're sampling randomly different parts of the genome in both the analysis. Um, so in order not to bias ourselves to particular regions uh, or concentrations. What I mean is if you have, for example, a one SNP every one thousand nucleotides in humans, what was that? What would that density be in Arabidopsis? That is the question. The, the sleep density uh, frequency yeah so yeah the, the density within the genome yes right so not not the, not the allele not the frequency in the populations right because that's that's uh, also different between arabidopsis and humans and um, yeah we think that uh, um, so arabidopsis in the wild is mainly selfing 
uh, and that affects the den that affects the, the the density and the um, heterozygosity also of uh, of Arabidopsis versus humans. And we definitely think this is contributing to uh, to these signals. But what exactly is the is the driving mechanisms of of this particular plot, we're, we're still not sure. Yes, we, we, we think that we can we can look at the mating uh, systems of Arabidopsis and and say something about that. Yeah. Other questions? Um, you haven't shown us the Middle East populations. Uh, I think I have. Uh, oh, OK. OK, I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, not hiding those. Uh, wait, let me see. High resolution. Yeah. yeah, here you can see them. Um, yeah, there's a there's a clear, I mean, they're clustered together. Uh, Druze Palestinian Bedouin populations are clustered together, uh, but they are differentiated. So like we expect on, there are on the same sort of small branch in the population structure tree, uh, but they are different enough so we can differentiate them uh, very clearly. Okay, so there's one last question. Have you only used MAF as input? No, the, the actual frequencies of these alleles. Yeah. So the, 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 the inputs are the, the explicit genomes of all these different individuals. Okay, so thank you very much again and thanks you to all the speakers uh, of this afternoon, this really exciting afternoon. Um, and we are looking forward to see everyone uh, next year in Tel Aviv, in flesh and blood. Um, anything you want to add, Karen? Just can't wait to see you all in Tel Aviv. Absolutely, <laughs> and thank you. It was really an outstanding mini symposium. And thank you for chairing Iran and Charles for being here and doing the introduction and all you do for Hugo. So everyone keep safe, keep well, and we'll see you hopefully very soon. And Professor Shen, it's time for you to go to sleep. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.